I'm Nick Stewart. I, I've been interested in aquatic plants for over 40 years, uh, and I, I um, now a, a freelance ecologist. Um, uh, some of you will come, have come across me because of a specialism in, uh, in carophytes, uh, stoneworts, uh, but I've always been interested in the ecology of aquatic plants uh, uh, ever since uh, I was quite young. Um, uh, and I think I originally got interested in them mainly because no one else was looking. Um, and uh, I would say that is still the case, but it is improving. Uh, and one of the things that I have been doing over uh, quite a few years is running workshops and, and uh, uh, teaching on, on a, uh, aquatic plants or stoneworks particularly or uh, uh, particular plant groups. Um, so this, uh, this talk is uh, uh, more or less a continuation of a couple of webinars that I uh, uh, presented uh, in the autumn last year. Um, uh, uh, one on aquatic plants uh, and one on, on stoneworts. Uh, and this evening I want to tackle uh, water starlets, uh, which has a reputation of being quite a difficult group, uh, but hopefully I can make it, uh, it, it uh, a little easier. Uh, they're not as difficult, uh, particularly if you know the limits of where you can, uh, of what you can identify. Um, so, uh, I, uh, the first thing to say uh, is how to recognize a water star. Um, and the, the uh, two particular things to, to take note of is that uh, the leaves are in equal opposite pairs. Um, uh, and if you look at the tips of the leaves, they have a little notch in the top, or sometimes they're more truncate at the top, but then they're not, they don't have a proper point. They have a, a bite out of the end. Um, and there are a few things that you might come across uh, in aquatic plants, which uh, might uh, steer you uh, away from, uh, 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 that might be confused with, uh, with water starworks. Um, one of the most, unfortunately, most common ones is uh, a swamp stone crop crash of a helmsy eye. Uh, it again has uh, equal opposite leaves, but you can see here that it has a, a much more defined point on the tip. Uh, it, like some of the stoneworks you'll see, uh, we'll, I'll come to this character a little later, but you'll see that the leaves or the, the, the stalks of the leaves join around the stem. It's a term that's called conate. Uh, uh, th so that's another feature that it, it, it shares with, with certainly some of the water starworks. Uh, another thing, it's a bit, uh, they tend to be quite a lot smaller than the most water starworks, but they, again, they have equal opposite leaves, uh, are, the, are the waterworks, uh, elatony. Um, uh, uh, and uh, some of the terrestrialized forms of uh, uh, a water starworks can look at they're usually a bit bigger, but uh, uh, can look a little like that. But the easiest way to, to just uh, check them is to have a look at the venation. You can see here the Kalitschke venation is sort of more or less parallel to the edges, whereas in Alatini uh, they diverge um, and have a little gland uh, at the tip uh, where, they, where they join uh, the, the margin. Um, this uh, uh, water person, Litherum portula, can look a bit like uh, uh, some water star where it's again equal opposite leaves, uh, no notch in the tip, there's a completely rounded tip. Uh, the most striking thing is, is this red colour of the stem, uh, which you would never get in any of the uh, uh, Kalitschkis. Uh, also, the stem is sort of angled. Not, not strongly so, but it, it's, it's uh, 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 an angle to it. And of course, the flowers are, are, are very different. Um, another thing that can be confusing, it's more, much more of a terrestrial plant, but uh, sometimes you can get it submerged in the water is the bog stitchwort. Uh, and that can sometimes look uh, a bit, bit like um, 
uh, a water star wet. Um, it tends to be more uh, solid and stocky and, and uh, like the sort of terrestrial plants. But you, again, you've got the opposite leaves. And I think uh, you'll see here that uh, it has this sort of conate base leaves. So sometimes it can throw you. Um, but the uh, easiest character to look at is that the stem is square. Uh, a bit rounded square, but but it's definitely angled, whereas uh, uh, a calitrochy stem is uh, completely cylindrical. Um, so th there are a number of books uh, which I would recommend if you're wanting to look at water starwets. Um, uh, in particular, I would point you to the BSBI handbook uh, written by Richard Lansdowne. Um, uh, one of several really good uh, um, handbooks that the BSBI has done on, on a, aquatic plants. Um, uh, it, unusually though, this one covers all of Europe. So there are a few, quite a few extra species that you won't come across in Britain, um, but it is a very excellent book and I would completely recommend it. Uh, also useful, uh, uh, it, it's quite useful for aquatic plants generally, but uh, but it has a useful section on water starworts is the plant crib. Uh, again, the section on calitrochy is written by Richard Lansdowne, who's, who's really the expert on, on this group. Um, uh, so th that, that will also be useful. Uh, and again, uh, same again, Richard Lansdowne has produced this field guide to river rhine plants, uh, and that is also a, has a useful stuff on, uh, on Kalichkis. Um, so there are seven species recorded in Ireland and Britain. Uh, so it's quite a nice manageable, it's not a, a, a big group, uh, so it, it, uh, it, it's uh, that makes it sort of quite simple. Um, one of these is extremely rare, calitrochy palustris. Um, so essentially, most of the time we're dealing with two translucent leaved ones uh, and four opaque leaved ones. Um, uh, and I'll start with the translucent leaved ones because they're relatively easy and and fairly distinct. Um, and uh, the, the, the two species are Calitrochy hermaphroditica and Calitrochy truncata. Um, and uh, the texture of these is very, very different from most of the common Calitrochys. Um, uh, and in fact, you're much more likely to confuse it with uh, uh, an aloe deer um, uh, uh, than because it's much more that sort of texture, translucent, sort of almost stained glass. Uh, uh, texture of leaf. Um, uh, main difference, uh, easy difference is that, uh, as I was saying before, the leaves are in pairs and they have these notches on the tips, whereas in Elodea the leaves are in threes and have much more pointed tips. Um, but uh, probably if you're familiar with the common calitrochies, you you might not immediately think this is a, a calitrochy until you look closely at, 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 at those leaf tips. Uh, the two species are quite easy to separate uh, when they're fruiting. Um, the fruits of Hermaphroditica have a very broad wing. You'll see there's this little flange, an obvious flange going round the, uh, uh, around the fruits. Uh, whereas in Calitrochy truncata, uh, you can see the fruits here, they're completely smooth around the edges, they're quite rounded and, and there's no wing at all. Uh, we'll have more pictures of wings, so uh, uh, which might clarify what we're talking about with wings, um, uh, but essentially that's the difference between the two. Um, uh, there are two subspecies uh, of uh, hermaphroditica uh, that occur uh, in Ireland and Britain, uh, although I would say not many people make make the distinction, but that it's based on the size of the fruits uh, and and the wing uh, as to uh, the the two species. Uh, don't think we probably know which ones are more common than the other. Um, uh, so if it'd be interesting to know if you if you're prepared to look. 
uh, the, there is just the one species, subspecies of truncator uh, in Britain, which is uh, Occidentalis. Um, one thing that uh, is uh, very marked is that there's quite a geographical separation between the two. Um, so uh, Hermaphroditica is much more of a northern species uh, and uh, sort of comes down uh, to the Midlands, both in Ireland uh, 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 and in England, uh, whereas Truncata uh, is much more southern. Um, uh, uh, there's one place uh, a dot here in Ireland, but actually uh, Paul Green has turned up uh, a little cluster of dots uh, uh, in the middle of Ireland and in, in the middle Shannon, um, we just discovered last year. And uh, uh, I think I think the if if you look at the uh, BSBI uh, Atlas website, you'll find a, a, a little cluster around here. Uh, but um, it. it it's still rare in, in both countries, um, uh, uh, but uh, do note that the uh, ranges do overlap. So don't immediately just uh, jump to the conclusion, it's not, uh, uh, it's northern, it must be hermaphroditica. Because I can tell you that uh, the, these, these records in Anglesey were overlit for quite a while because everybody assumed that it was hermaphroditica. Uh, and it was only sort of uh, after a while that people caught on, actually there are both of them in Anglesey. Uh, and, th and that may well be the case uh, also in the, the new sites uh, uh, in the Shannon. Although there are, haven't actually, I think the, the cluster is round about the, this uh, grid point cross uh, where there haven't been any previous records for hermaphroditic. So th those two are fairly simple and don't cause complications. Uh, the, uh, some people think they can separate them vegetatively, but I think uh, they fruit quite readily uh, and I would rely on the fruits and not, and not try and attempt them uh, uh, from vegetatively. Um, but uh, if we move on to the opaque leaf species, uh, you can see the texture of the leaves is very different. It's a much more solid. Sometimes underwater, they can be a little bit sort of more translucent, um, but uh, the texture is very different from those elodea like uh, species that we've just been talking about. Now, these are more difficult. Uh, uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the other difference, there are a couple of other differences between the uh, translucent and the opaque leaved ones. Um, firstly, uh, the truncata and hermaphroditica, the uh, uh, leaf stems don't actually uh, join around the stem. Uh, this, this conate feature is a, is a, a feature of all the uh, opaque leaf ones. Um, and separates the two groups. Uh, uh, another difference, uh, if uh, anyone's interested in exploring, um, is that uh, the opaque leaf ones produce these little scales. You see these little bumps go, uh, in profile on the stem. There's a little uh, scares, scales, they're sometimes called peltate hairs. Um, uh, and uh, you only get those in the opaque leaf ones. Um, <clears throat> there are some differences between the species of, of the uh, in the shape uh, or the number of cells in, in these scales, uh, but on the whole, there are usually much easier characters to uh, and uh, 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 and I think there's a, quite a bit of overlap uh, anyway. So, um, but uh, uh, particularly if you uh, there's a, a French thesis by uh, uh, Schotzman, which uh, discusses quite a lot of detail about these, these peltate scales. Um, the main problem with these opaque leaf ones is that they are very well adapted to uh, water level changes. Uh, and, that, and it reacts to water level changes by sort of changing its leaf form. So, uh, 
it makes it very difficult to, to do any identification uh, based on the leaf shape because they're plastic to the, uh, to the conditions. Uh, and this illustration from the handbook, um, uh, I think illustrates quite nicely the, the range of stuff that you get. Uh, when the, the plants are, are young and underwater, you get these uh, very narrow leaved ones on, on uh, several species. And as they get up towards the surface, they produce uh, wider leaves. Uh, and uh, if things that conditions are very settled, you can get quite a solid rosette um, uh, of, uh, with a number of leaves all sort of clustered together. But what happens if the water level rises again? Well, you, uh, the, what happens is that the stem within this ros rosette starts elongating. And probably what we're looking at here is actually a rosette that might have formed about here, and then the stem is elongated because the water levels have risen. Uh, and you can see that the leaves are, are quite wide because they were in the rosette. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, it, when you got up to the top here, it's probably settled as a, a new water level. So you, you can get a huge variation uh, uh, of, of, of leaf shapes. Uh, and sometimes all mixed together. Uh, and um, uh, this, this plant in the middle here is probably a terrestrialized form. So uh, another adaptation is that if the water level drops and it's exposed, it can carry on growing on the mud uh, and it will form this sort of stiff leaved, uh, quite small leaved uh, form. Uh, all, this, all the opaque leaved species do that. Um, uh, and looks completely different again. So I'm now going to make it quite a lot simpler. If it's not flowering or fruiting, it's easy. It's just calitrically spur. And the best thing is not to go any further. Um, uh, if you're looking for fruits, the best time is around now. Um, uh, you'll often find that, that much uh, find them fruiting better earlier in the summer um, and uh, as you get later in the season it's often best to look at terrestrial plants they seem to ret retain fruiting uh, for longer but if you do have fruits uh, then you can do uh, quite a lot um, now these two, this is a, a, a key, uh, one of several keys which we've, uh, which we've uploaded onto the uh, BSBI's Aquatic Plant Project website. Uh, so uh, uh, what, what, what you can do is just laminate these and you can take them out of the field and just uh, uh, have them to hand. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, the, as I say, there are a number of keys for different aquatic plant groups, uh, and uh, I hope that they're useful. The two at the top here were the two uh, hermaphroditica and, and truncata with the translucent leaves, and you can see that, uh, that in the fruits there is a sort of solid part, which is the, which is the seed with uh, obviously um, a coating around it, uh, and, and extending out from that, uh, in this species in particular, you get this flange, which is more translucent, uh, and we'll have some pictures in a moment. <coughs> Whereas truncata is completely rounded on the edges uh, uh, and um, doesn't have a wing at all. Um, but so these, uh, these ones here are the opaque leaved ones, and there are four species. Um, that you're going to come across on a regular basis. One of these is uh, quite easy. Uh, it, it, the first thing you look at is the position of the style. Um, you'll see in these three, the, the style uh, sticks, sticks out from the top of the fruit. And the, the style persists for quite a long time. So as the, as the fruits mature, they're usually still easy to see. <coughs> um, Whereas in uh, Britia, uh, the style uh, comes out of the side of the fruit uh, and it just sort of sticks out like this. Uh, 
Uh, you sometimes get a bit worn, but you can usually still see the style quite distinctly uh, if you look at several fruits. Uh, so if it's coming out the side, that's easy. It's, it's calitrically brittle. Uh, if it's coming out of the top, you have these three species and essentially you've got stagnalis, which has a very broad wing uh, and <coughs> uh, platycarpa, which has a narrow wing around the fruit uh, and obtuse angular, uh, which has no wing at all. Uh, and uh, you can either look at it from the side or these are looking sort of straight down from, well, either from the bottom or the top. Uh, and you'll see that when there's a wing, there's, a, there's quite an obvious V between the, uh, the, the fruits, whereas uh, in obtuse angular, you've got a, a much more rounded profile uh, uh, <coughs> around. Um, and of course, platycarpa is a, it, in the middle as it still has a, a, a V shape, but it's a much wider V shape. Um, so if you've got fruits, that's great. You can uh, uh, you can identify them fairly easily uh, with a problem. There is a problem that I'll come to in a moment. So here we've got some examples of Calitrici brutia. Um, uh, and you can see here, there's the style sticking out the side of the fruit. Uh, again, here, uh, the, there's a style sticking out there. And this is looking end on, and you can sort of see again, the, the, the style is, is coming out of the side. Um, uh, the, it, uh, this does have a, a, a narrow wing. It's not very obvious. Uh, you can see it a bit more there. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the, it, it ha it's a, a narrowly winged uh, fruit. Stagnalis um, has this much broader wing. And, and if you get the light behind it, you can see that the, the seed part uh, is much more solid and opaque. Uh, and you have this translucent uh, wing around uh, around the outside, um, uh, which contrasts quite a lot with, uh, with the darker centre. So Stagnalis with a, a broad wing, uh, you've got Platycarpa with a narrow wing, um, and then Obtuse Angular. Uh, this actually does look as though it's got a wing, but that, uh, that's just the way the photograph has, has worked. Uh, Actually, if you looked particularly from above, it would be a, uh, a sort of look much more rounded. But this is unfortunately the best picture that I could I could uh, uh, produce for this. Um, there is one other species to mention, uh, which is calitrically palustris. Uh, it's an extremely rare uh, species. Uh, it likes uh, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral sort of field ponds that uh, dry out, sort of places you would get uh, Limicella aquatica or uh, burr marigolds or uh, that, that sort of habitat that uh, seems to be uh, uh, what it likes. Um, uh, I think there are, there are a few sites in, uh, 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 near Galway uh, and there are a few sites in Scotland uh, and that's about it. Um, and the key feature of this is that it has, when the fruits are mature, they, they go black. Um, uh, in the previous ones you, you, uh, I was showing you, uh, the fruits look uh, more like the immature one here, with, which is sort of green. Um, but uh, this has black fruits. And in fact, the wing, you can see that it has a wing at the top, but this tends to disappear when you get to the bottom of the fruit. So it's, it, the wing is widest around, it's, it's quite a narrow wing, but it tends to be widest near the tip. Um, uh, we haven't got any styles showing here, but the styles would be sticking out at the top, uh, as in Stagnalis and uh, uh, Platycarpa and Obtuse Angular. Um, I do need to, word of caution here is that Calitrici brutia also produces dark fruits when they mature. Um, so you do need to check the style. You can see the style just sort of sticking, coming out the side here. So this one is Calitrici brutia and not Calitrici palustris. That can catch people out. So just, just be aware of that. Uh, but so you need to check where, where the style is coming from. Um, now, 
the complication, the only complication it, it, with the fruits is that the difference between a broad wing and a narrow wing can be quite subtle. Uh, you can, uh, uh, I would say that if you have an obvious broad wing, then you can be fairly confident that it's stagnalis. Uh, but sometimes stagnalis can have quite a narrow wing uh, that's difficult to differentiate from platycarpal. If you're in doubt, there's a, there's a very good way of separating. Uh, and that is to look at, at the pollen. Uh, it's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, you see these yellow dots. Uh, these are the anthers sticking out from the rosettes. Uh, uh, you can see them here. All you do is you take one of these, you put it on a slide, uh, uh, squ squash it, and just, just sort of sugar it around a bit so that, the, uh, so that it spreads out the pollen. And you'll uh, see uh, uh, little, little pollen grains, uh, probably uh, the best magnification is somewhere around times 100. Um, but you can, you can make things out at, at lower, uh, at lower um, magnifications, but uh, that's probably the, the optimum. Uh, and what you will see um, is that the pollen of stagnalis has completely circular or just slightly off circular. Uh, those are obtuse angular, are elongated, sort of bean-shaped. Um, well, those are platycarpa. You have uh, quite a sort of mixture of shapes. There are some that you would say looked a bit stagnalis-like. There are other ones which are more bean-shaped, like, uh, like obtuse angular. Uh, but also mixed amongst these, which, uh, the, the unique form uh, that are unique to platycarpa are these rounded triangular ones, uh, the sort of three angled ones, which you would you won't get those in any in either of the other two. Um, so, it, but the the pollen is much more irregular in, in platycarpa. Um, uh, and here are some examples of what you would actually see uh, under a microscope. You can see here stagnalis with its circular pollen. Uh, um, obtuse angular with these bean shaped things. And here you've got uh, some of these, we've actually got a four angled one there, which is uh, quite unusual, uh, but th those, there's a three angled one um, and there's another three angled one. Um, uh, so this is a good reliable uh, way if you, if you have got the microscope, uh, a, there are some people that do all their, um, their uh, identifications are based on the pollen because it's quite it's quite a simple thing to do. Um, now I'll come back to the vegetative stuff. Uh, as I said before, uh, they are not very reliable uh, and I should perhaps should interject here. Uh, if you're using Poland's vegetative key, uh, I would advise against trying to identify Kalitschke from that. It is very likely to take, try and take you too far uh, because, uh, uh, and may quite often take you in, uh, down the wrong way uh, uh, quite frequently. So I would advise yet not uh, that you don't use Poland uh, uh, for Kalitschke. Uh, in idealized conditions, there are some differences between the, the, the particularly the rosettes between the different species. Um, uh, and it does mean that if you've got two or three species growing together, it's usually quite easy to pick out the difference between them. However, if you then go to another site where the conditions are different, then you would start to sort of uh, find different. Uh, uh, that the, the characters wouldn't be consistent be, because of this plasticity to, to uh, uh, water, water level variation. But the, uh, the thing, the features to the can sort of point you uh, in the thing, the right direction is that stagnatus uh, in an ideal rosette tends to have very round leaves, uh, uh, whereas platycarpa uh, tends to. Uh, be more elongate. Um, obtuse angular tends to have more leaves than the rosettes, uh, 
so you can see here the rosette has, has about 20 leaves in it, whereas these, these other ones, the rosettes are, are just 10 leaves. Um, uh, and often this, this sort of, you can see it's slightly ridged. Um, that's quite a typical feature in a well-developed obtuse angular rosette. Uh, often the leaves are a little bit more grayish as well. Um, but these are just a guide. You wouldn't want to rely on these for identification, certainly not on their own. Um, uh, so just to, to illustrate this, uh, if you looked at those rosettes, you might think, well, those are quite round. That, that's a bit like uh, Stagnellis. Well, the fruits show that it was obtuse angular. Uh, so a, a, a typical example of, of where you would be very easily misled. Uh, this is another one. You can see that it's got uh, the, these very narrow underwater leaves. Um, uh, and uh, the fact that it's got these, uh, these almost parallel sided underwater leaves does, does rule out stagnalis. Uh, so in fact, if you have linear leaves like this and fruits with wings with the style sticking at the top, then you can be confident that it's, it's platycarpa. In combination, you can use some of the vegetative pieces features, but don't rely on, on, on their own. This one, you might think, oh, well, that looks a bit like the, the previous picture of, of uh, Brutia. But again, this one's obtuse angular. Just shows how plastic they are and how uh, really don't use uh, vegetative features on their own. Uh, there is, however, one vegetative feature that you can use and is reliable. And that is, uh, it, it, if in uh, Calitrici brutia, if you have these parallel sided leaves and you have this uh, expanded tip, uh, that are sometimes called spanner tips. Uh, and basically what you're looking at here is that you can see the profile of the leaf uh, is, is more or less parallel sided. And then around the notch, uh, the leaf gets wider um, and it's sort of, almost looks a bit forked or spanner-like, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> if it does that, then you know that it's Calitrici brutia uh, and you actually can name it to the variety Hamulata. Um, but if it's not expanded like that, uh, and quite often brutia does, doesn't expand, it's only in certain conditions that you get these, these nice spanner tips. Um, then you still just have to call it a uh, Kalitschke spur. Um, and in fact, uh, I've put this in as an example of uh, one that I would be very hesitant uh, to, uh, I suspect that it probably is pretty. You can see that it's just getting a little bit wider here, but uh, I wouldn't find that terribly convincing. And I think I would probably still put that one down as Kalitschke spur. Um, I should perhaps say something about Kalitschke brutia var brutia. Um, now, this, uh, I don't have a lot of experience of uh, brutia, brutia, um, but so th this is sort of my, what I've gathered from conversation with Richard Lansdowne um, uh, and my interpretation of them. But essentially, you can only identify brutia, brutia with reliably if, you, if the plants are terrestrial. Um, uh, and then uh, what you're looking for is that the fruits are, are conspicuously stalked up to, up to a centimeter long in certain cases, but, but usually it's sort of a little shorter than that. Um, and that is supposed to be a reliable character of brutia. Uh, on the other hand, Hamulata, the only reliable identifiable ca uh, identification character uh, is when the plants are aquatic and, the, and it's producing those spanner tips that I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, th there is sometimes mentioned that these, the tips of the notches are asymmetric in, in Brutio var Brutio. Uh, I don't think it... Uh, uh, it, it does occur 
um, but I don't think it's a reliable character. It's certainly not present uh, all the time. Um, uh, so it, it's it's a very weak character. Uh, so it's it's a uh, it's a messy situation, uh, and probably uh, it, 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 they they're pretty difficult to separate. However, there does appear to be uh, a genotypic uh, difference um, in, in terms of chromosome numbers. Uh, I would say that it probably needs further work to, to be sure that it's consistent. Um, so whether or not you try and separate them depends probably on your view about cryptic genotypes as to uh, whether they're worth the effort or not. Um, uh, personally, I'm not enthusiastic, but uh, that's, that's just my view. Uh, there are other people that regard genotypes as, uh, as things that should have uh, higher levels of, of separation, even at species level. Um, I was just going to finish by uh, talking a little bit about habitats. Um, uh, Kletschke hermaphroditica is uh, more or less entirely a lake species uh, and tends to be in nice species rich mesotrophic lakes. Not always, but it, it's often uh, in, in nice places with lots of other aquatic plants. Kletschke brutia is much less fussy. It, uh, can take quite a lot of nutrients uh, and it tends to be more often in rivers and canals. It does occur in lakes, uh, certainly too, um, but it, it, it can uh, equally be in flowing water uh, uh, as in static water. Um, the other four, uh, I discussed earlier that the calitrically clusters tends to be in uh, ephemeral ponds, but uh, the, so can all of these other species, but it tends to be more specific to uh, ephemeral pools. Um, the, uh, there's probably too much to take in at, uh, at, at, at all at once, but uh, the features that I was going to particularly point out is that uh, in the uplands, you're tending to deal with, uh, have just brutia and stagnalis, uh, whereas uh, all four of these common species uh, occur in the lowlands. Um, so it does give an advantage uh, if you're in an upland situation, it cuts down the field. Um, uh, and the, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that it's a common assumption that Britia is always in acid soft waters. That's certainly not the case. It, it uh, can equally grow in alkaline situations, but it is, I would say more sensitive to nutrient enrichment than uh, uh, the other species. Uh, these three can take quite a lot of nutrients, uh, whereas I think Britia doesn't. Um, so if you're in a situation like this, it, it actually makes uh, it becomes a whole lot easier because your choices are Calitrici stagnalis and Calitrici Britia. You wouldn't get Platycarpa or obtuse anger in a in, in an upland uh, lake like this. And that does make it easier because you're dealing then with the two extremes of, the, of, of leaf variation. Uh, so stagnalis, very often round leaved, uh, or quite, but always broad, broader leaves, whereas brutia tends to be uh, narrow leaved. And so you can actually make some headway uh, vegetatively uh, 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 when you're in this situation. Um, but as I said before, Britia can be in lowland lakes too, so don't, don't rule it out. Uh, and uh, so in, in a lowland ditch like this, you can have any or all four uh, of, of these uh, four opaque leaf species. Um, so I just wanted to finish up by saying thank you. Uh, thank you to the BSBI for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Um, thanks uh, also to the National Parks and Wildlife Service who provided uh, uh, financial support uh, for, for the BSBI on this. 
I also wanted to thank uh, Claudia Ferguson Smythe and Richard Lansdowne, um, who uh, have provided a lot of the, the, the very good pictures uh, and drawings in, in here uh, in this talk, uh, and have also helped me with uh, the, uh, building the preparation. So I hope that makes things a little easier for you. Uh, they, uh, there are, uh, they're not as difficult as they're made out, but just you just have to know that you, there are uh, occasions when you, you, quite a few occasions when all you can do is just record Kalitschke spa. Uh, so I think uh, that's where I will uh, leave, you, leave you with a nice picture of, uh, of a water star work cruise. Nick, thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, what a beautifully illustrated talk uh, and so clearly given. Um, I think the, the, the key things for, for me was uh, do not record uh, a Kalitschke unless it's in fruit. Uh, that, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, or at least only record Kalitschke spi. Um, and I think the, the other thing I've, I thought was really interesting in the uplands, it really only you only like to encounter Stagnalis and Brutia. Yeah, I I, I think uh, it it does make things uh, a lot easier when you when you're up on the hills. Uh, now we've got a few questions, only a few. So it, uh, if if uh, there are more questions, uh, get typing uh, now into Q and A. Uh, Fal asks, uh, how long does it take for Kalitschke to respond to a change in water level? Um, uh, days. Um, uh, uh, they, will, they will start elongating more or less straight away. Uh, so, so quite quickly? Yeah, no, no. I, I've actually, um, uh, I, I do have some fresh material which we can look at maybe uh, a bit of time. Um, but uh, one of them I collected for the original talk um, two weeks ago, uh, and uh, what were nice rosettes is now completely elongated into bits of string. All right. <laughs> um, and another question, uh, this time by Letizia. She says, great talk, thank you. Could you explain again the differences between translucent leaves and opaque leaves? Okay, a, a few, um, if I can uh, zip back a bit, uh, I can sort of show those again. Um, if, let's see if I, uh, if you give me a moment, um, I may have to go all the way back through. Um, So, uh, I mean, first thing is, is the texture of them. The, this is a much more solid opaque leaf. Um, and if we go back to uh, these ones, the, they tend to be darker green, whereas the other ones tend to be gray green, uh, and they're uh, much more translucent uh, and um, similar, quite easily confused uh, or overlooked uh, if it's growing in a mycella deer. Because it's it's that sort of same translucent uh, sort of stained glassy texture, um, but the additional things that that uh, that that you can use uh, is uh, if we can go back to sorry um, yes uh, the the additional things that that uh, if there's any doubt, if sometimes the underwater leaves of, of the opaque leaf ones can be a little bit more translucent. Uh, but the uh, things that you can double check, uh, are, this is the, the base of the, of the leaf, the leaf stalks. Um, and in the opaque leaf ones, they meet and join around the stem. Uh, the term is conate. Uh, whereas in the translucent leaves, the, there's a definite split between the two. Um, uh, and the other thing is that the opaque leaf ones uh, produce these, these funny little scales on the stem. No idea what they're for. Um, uh, and you won't get these little, these little bumps in, in the, uh, 
uh, in the translucent leaved ones. Okay, thanks. Uh, Clive asks, in three dimensions, would the pollen of um, obtusangular look obscurely tetrahedral, thus given a range of shapes in 2D? Uh, no, I think I think they're essentially cylindrical, uh, with rounded ends, um, uh, and they tend to look the same whichever angle you look at them. Um, so if I sort of jump to the the pollen here, you can you can see that, that they're pretty consistent. So I presume they just roll around in a sort of they're sort of cylindrical in in cross I mean circular and cross section. Yeah. Um, um uh otherwise you would see sort of odd odd ends on here uh, whereas they they're all con pretty consistently bean shaped okay an another very different uh, question uh, what eats starworts and are there certain invertebrates that are specific to certain a particular starwort species um i have really don't know the answer to that. Uh, there are certainly things that, <laughs> uh, I mean, there are birds that will eat them, of course, the, particularly the herbivorous birds, but in terms of invertebrates, um, uh, I'm afraid I, I can't really answer that. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there are some specific ones, but I'm not sure it, well, I think that there's a, there's a project here for someone um, because, of course, one of the issues is actually making sure that you've identified the Kalitschke correctly. Um, uh, and and <clears throat> this is actually a problem that I meant actually should, should mention, is that if you start looking at historical records, you very quickly become unstuck with some of the, uh, with the opaque leaf ones. So the, there are various names that were used. Uh, I think Vernalis tended to be more or less any species that was terrestrialized. Uh, and um, so there, there has been quite a lot of difficulty in the past in, in terms of identification of Klitschke. I think we have a much clearer idea now of, of where the species boundaries are. Uh, but that does mean that some of the information like associated invertebrates uh, can, can uh, there can be issues as to whether they identified the, the, the species correctly of the, of the clitch. Yeah, yeah. Um, next question, uh, John Faulkner asks, he, he keeps specimens and dishes of water uh, outside uh, to wait for anthers to appear, but sometimes they deteriorate very rapidly and other times they stay healthy. Have you any hints on how to encourage anthers to appear? Um, uh, in terms of deterioration, uh, that can often be, uh, they don't take well to being battered. Um, and this is actually, is quite an issue if you're sending calypsoids through the post. Um, if they go through the rollers, they usually, by the time they arrive, they end up as mush. Um, so it may be connected to treatment, uh, uh, sort of how, bat how much battering they get bef before they're, they're, put, they're put in, in your pots. Um, but uh, other than that, I don't know the answer to that as to uh, what encourages them uh, better. Um, <clears throat> it's probably, I mean, they don't tend to flower so well when the water's deep. So uh, I would suspect that shallower water tends to encourage flowering more uh, rather than putting them in a, in a deep tub. Yeah. Um, uh, and often uh, terrestrialized material, you can, you, you can sometimes find pollen more, e a sort of anther sticking out easier than, than in aquatic ones. Um, and Claudia, uh, says you should mention the fact that in very young fruit of stagnalysis, the style appears to come out the top before it, it comes out the side. Uh, is that, yeah, no, is that something that people should watch out for? 
yeah, if we go, I, I, I don't know if she meant to say stagnalis, because stagnalis, the style state stays out sticking out the top uh, all the time. But I think what she maybe oh, she, she meant Brutia. Yeah, was, was Brutia. Uh, <clears throat> when the when the flowers are very young, uh, the style uh, comes does come out of the top, but immediately bends down the side of the fruit. Um, and what happens is that as the seed um, uh, grows up, it, it grows up around the uh, around the style. And the, and the style is sort of trapped, sticking out the side. And you could possibly see it, it sort of happening here. You can, you can sort of see the, the style sort of going back into uh, between the fruits and, and probably coming out of uh, sort of <coughs> things. But, but what happens is, is that as the fruit grows, it, it traps, the, traps the style. Um, uh, and so it appears as though it's sticking out the side. If that makes sense. I'm not sure I've explained it terribly. Okay, last couple questions. Um, what magnification microscope would you need to look at pollen grains? Um, I think the, the sort of best is it is around times a hundred, um, but you can see them you, 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 um, at lower magnifications. You can. Uh, uh, mm, Make make things out at, at, at sort of, but uh, it does um, need probably more than um, some of the simple um, uh, viewing microscopes. Um, so it, that is a problem because, of course, not many people have have compound microscopes. But um, if you do that, it is actually a very easy way of identifying. Them. Claudia, do, do you want to say something? I was just going to say there was a question from John Faulkner about how to store these when you have them growing on your bench. Um, I find that if I don't disturb them and I leave them for a couple of days, they will often um, produce um, anthers. And don't be discouraged. If you, if you think it hasn't produced anthers, just cut off the top rosette. And often there'll be a small, um, anther underneath the top leaves. If you poke around, often you can find pollen, even though you think it doesn't have any, if you just look. Oh, thank you. Oh, great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, this, <laughs> yeah. I think this, this might be the last question, um, unless anyone's a very fast typer. Um, do calitrophy always grow in the edges of lakes and shallow water? Um, uh, well, uh, for the most part, because they are adapted to sort of terrestrialization and, and sort of uh, fluctuating water levels, uh, most of them are uh, uh, in the shallows of the opaque leaf ones. Um, the exception to that is Brutia can grow in quite deep water because it doesn't need to get to the surface to, to fruit or flower. Um, uh, I, it, it, I think uh, I may, may be wrong on this. I think the the, the other one, Stagnolus platycarpa and obtuse angular, they use the water surface for uh, transporting pollen. Whereas I think the in Brutia, um, uh, uh, it, it, pollination occurs underwater, and so it can uh, survive. Uh, in quite deep water, sort of uh, two or three meters. Um, so the, the, that is a separation. Um, but also I would say that hermaphroditic can be, uh, again, doesn't need to get to the surface to, to flower and fruit. Um, I would think truncata likewise doesn't need to be. Um, so uh, again, they can be, and in, in fact, hermaphroditic is often in, in sort of two or three meters of water. Um, uh, but can come in quite shallow as well. So uh, yeah, uh, Brutia, uh, Hermaphroditica, and maybe Truncata uh, can be in quite deep water, but otherwise uh, the, they tend to be shallow water species uh, because they need to be, they need to get to the surface to the flower. Lovely. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Nick, thank you for answering those questions so beautifully. Uh, thank you participants uh, for asking uh, such an interesting range of questions. And uh, thanks again for our, our wonderful presentation.